Chapter Fifteen of the Second Latchkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Latchkey by Charles Norris and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter Fifteen. Nelson Smith at Home. The Countess de Santiago took her defeat like a soldier. But her line, both of attack and defense, was of the sapping and mining order. Once she had cared as deeply as it was in her to care for the man known to London as Nelson Smith. He was of the type which calls forth intense feelings in others. Men liked him immensely or disliked him extremely. Women admired him fervently or detested him cordially. It was not possible to regard him with indifference. His personality was too magnetic to leave his neighbors cold, and as a rule it was only those whom he wished to keep at a distance who disliked him. As for Magdalena de Santiago, for a time she had enjoyed thinking herself in love. There were reasons, she knew, why she could not hope to be the man's wife, and if he had chosen a plain woman to help him on in the world, she would have made no objection to his marriage. But at first sight she had realized that Annesley Grail, shy and unconscious of power to charm as she was, might be dangerous. Madalena had anxiously watched the two together, and at breakfast the day before the wedding she had distrusted the light in the man's eyes as he had looked at the girl. It had seemed incredible that he should be in love with a creature so pale, so formless still in character, as Annesley appeared to Madalena, that a man like Don should be caught by a pair of grey eyes and a softness which was only the beauty of youth. Still, the countess had been made to suffer, and if she could have found a way to prevent the marriage without alienating her friend, she would have seized it. But she could think of no way, except to drop a sharp reminder of what Don owed to her. The hint had been unheeded. The marriage had taken place, and Madalena had been obliged to play the part of the bride's friend and chaperone. Afterward, to be sure, she had been paid. Her reward had come in the shape of invitations and meetings with desirable people. Nelson Smith's marriage had given her a place in the world, and, at first, her success consoled her. Soon, however, the pain of jealousy overcame the anodyne. She could not rest. She was forever asking herself whether Don were glad of her success for her own sake, or because it distracted her attention from him. Was he falling in love with his wife, or was his way of looking at the girl, of speaking to the girl, only an intelligent piece of acting in the drama? Once or twice Madalena tried being cavalier in her manner to Annesley. She dared not be actually rude, and Nelson Smith appeared not to notice, but afterward the offender was punished by missing some invitation. This might have been taken as the proof for which she searched, could she have been sure where lay the responsibility for the slight whether on the shoulders of Annesley or of Annesley's husband. Madalena strove to make herself believe that the fault was the girl's, but she could not decide. Sometimes she flattered her vanity that Annesley was trying to keep her away from Don. Again she would wrap herself in black depression as in a pal, believing that the man was seeking an excuse to put her outside the intimacy of his life. Then she burned for revenge upon them both, yet her hands were tied. Her fate seemed to be bound up with the fate of Nelson Smith, and evil which might threaten his career would overwhelm hers also. She spent dark moments in striving to plan some brilliant yet safe coup which would ruin him and Annesley, in case she should find out that he had tired of her. At last, by much concentration, her mind developed an idea which appeared feasible. She saw a thing she might do without compromising herself but first she must be certain where the blame lay. Constance Annesley Seton's explanation over the telephone left her little doubt of the truth. She had the self-control to answer quietly. Then, when she had hung up the receiver, she let herself go to pieces. She raged up and down the room, swearing in Spanish, tears tracing red stains on her magnolia complexion. She dashed a vase full of flowers on the floor and felt a fierce thrill as it crashed to pieces. "'That is you, Michael Donaldson,' she cried. "'Like this I will break you. "'That girl shall curse the hour of your meeting. "'She shall wish herself back in the house of the old woman "'where she was a servant. "'And you can do nothing, nothing to hurt me.' 
Later that morning, when she had composed herself, Madalena wrote a letter to Lady Annesley Seton. My kind friend. I am sorry that I may not be with you for Easter, and sorry for the reason. I can read between the lines, but that does not interest you. Myself, I can do no more for your protection in the unknown danger which threatens. But again, I am in one of those psychic moods, when I have glimpses of things beyond the veil. It comes to me that, if the archdeacon friend of your cousin could be asked to join your house-party with his wife, and especially with his relative who is so rare a judge of jewels, is his name not Ruthven Smith, trouble might be prevented. This is vague advice, but I cannot be more definite, because I am saying these things under guidance. I am not responsible, nor can I explain why the message is sent. I feel that it is important. But you must not mention that it comes from me. Nelson and his wife would resent that, and the scheme would fall to the ground. Write and tell me what you do. I shall not be easy in my mind until your house party is over. May all go well. Yours gratefully and affectionately, Madalena. P.S. Better speak of having the Smiths to Mrs. Nelson, not her husband. He might refuse. Archdeacon Smith and his wife and their cousin, Ruthven Smith, were the last persons on earth in whom Constance would have expected the Countess de Santiago to interest herself. All the more, therefore, was Lady Annesley Seton ready to believe in a supernatural influence. Madalena's request to be kept out of the affair would have meant nothing to her, had she not agreed that the Nelson Smiths would object to the Countess's dictation. Constance proposed the Smith family as guests in a casual way to Annesley, when they were out shopping together, saying that it would be nice for Anne to have her friends at Valley House. "'The Archdeacon wouldn't be able to come,' said Annesley. "'Easter is a busy time for him, and Mrs. Smith wouldn't leave him to go into the country.' "'What a dear, old-fashioned wife!' laughed Connie. "'Well, what about their cousin, that Mr. Ruthven Smith, who used to stay at your Gorgons till our friend the burglar band called on him? There are things in Valley House which would interest an expert in jewels. And you've never asked him to anything, have you?' "'Oh, yes,' said Annesley. "'He's been invited every time I've asked the Archdeacon and Mrs. Smith, but he always refused, saying he was too deaf and dull for dinner-parties.' I'm sure he would hate a house-party far worse. Why not give the poor man a chance to decide, Constance persisted. He must be a nervous wreck since the burglary. A change ought to do him good. Besides, he would love Valley House. If you like to make a wager, I bet you something that he'd jump at the invitation. Annesley refused the wager, but she agreed that it would be nice to have all three of the Smiths. Constance was supposed to be hostess in her own house, though Knight was responsible for the financial side of the Easter plan, and it was for her to ask the guests, even those chosen by the Nelson Smiths. Remembering Madalena's hint that Nelson might refuse to add Ruthven Smith's name to the list, Connie gave Annesley no time to consult her husband. While her companion was being fitted for a frock at Harrod's, Lady Annesley Seton availed herself of the chance to write two letters, one to Mrs. Smith, inviting her and the Archdeacon, another to Ruthven, saying that she wrote at dear Anne's express wish, as well as her own. She added cordially on her own account, I have heard so much of you from Anne that it would be a pleasure to show you the Valley House treasures, which I think you would appreciate. Do come. She stamped her letters and slipped them into the box at the Harrod Post Office, before going to see if Anne were ready. Nothing more was said about the invitation for the Smiths until that evening at dinner, when it occurred to Annesley to mention it. Knight had come home late, just in time to dress, and she had not thought to speak of the house-party. "'Oh, Knight,' she said, "'Cousin Constance proposed asking the Archdeacon and his wife and Mr. Ruthven Smith. I'm sure the Archdeacon can't come, but Mr. Ruthven might perhaps... Oh, I don't think I'd have him with a lot of people he doesn't know, and who don't want to know him,' Knight vetoed the idea. "'He's clever in his way, but it's not a social way.' Among the lot we're going to have, he'd be like an owl among peacocks. But he'd love their jewels, Annesley persevered. They'll bring some of the most beautiful ones in England. You said so yourself. I'm thinking more of their pleasure than his, said Knight. He's deaf as well as dull. The peacocks are invited already, and the owl isn't, so... I'm afraid he is. When Anne agreed that she'd like to have the Smiths, I wrote it once, and by this time they've got my letters." Constance broke in with a pretense at penitence. 
Oh, dear, I have put my foot into it with the best intentions. What shall we do? Nothing, said Knight. If they've been asked, they must come if they want to. I doubt if they will. That doubt was dispelled with the morning post. Mrs. Smith was full of regrets for herself and the archdeacon, but Ruthven accepted in his precise manner, with much pleasure and gratitude for so kind an attention. The matter was settled, and Connie telephoned to Madalena. No archdeacon, no Mrs. Archdeacon, but I've bagged the jewelman. Will he be strong enough alone to spread over us that mantle of mysterious protection your crystal showed you? I hope so, the countess answered. Yet the woman at the other end of the wire thought the voice sounded dull, and was disappointed, even vaguely anxious. Her anxiety would have increased if she could have seen the face of the seeress. Now that the match was close to the fuse, Madalena had a wild impulse to draw back. It was not too late. Nothing irrevocable had been done. Ruthven Smith's acceptance of the invitation to Valley House would mean only a few days of boredom for his fellow guests, unless she herself made the next move in the game. Before she decided to make it, she resolved to see the man of whom she thought as Michael Donaldson. So far nothing had happened to raise any visible barrier between them. She was not supposed to know that he did not want her to join the Easter House party, and he and she and Annesley were on friendly terms. It would be easy for her to see Don, to see him alone, if she could only choose the right time, unless... There was an unless, but she thought the face of the butler would settle it. There were certain times on certain days when Nelson Smith was at home for certain people. These days were not those when Annesley and Constance were at home. In fact, they had been chosen purposely in order not to clash. The American millionaire had, from his first appearance in London, interested himself in more than one charitable society. Representatives of these associations called upon him during appointed hours and were shown straight to his den. Indeed, they were the only persons welcomed there, but the Countess de Santiago had some reason to expect that an exception might be made in her favor. Luckily, the day when she heard the news from Lady Annesley Seton was one of the two days in the week when Nelson Smith was certain not to be out of the house in the afternoon. Luckily, also, she knew that his wife was equally certain to be absent. Anita was going to play bridge at a house where Madalena was invited. She got her maid to telephone an excuse. The Countess had a bad headache. Had she said heartache, it would have been nearer the truth. But one does not tell the truth in these matters. Not for years, not since the strenuous times when Don had saved her from serious trouble and put her on the road to success, had Madalena Santiago been so unhappy. Whichever way she looked, she saw darkness ahead, yet she hoped something from her talk with Don. Just what, she did not specify to herself in words, but something. I wish to see Mr. Nelson Smith on important business, she said, looking the butler straight in the eyes. It was he who opened the door of the Portman Square house on the charity days. He gave her back look for look, losing the air of respectable servitude and suddenly becoming a human being. Mr. Smith is not alone, he answered, contriving to give some special meaning to the ordinary words which made them almost cryptic. But I think he will be free before long, if you care to wait, madame, and I will mention that you are here. You must say it is important, she impressed upon him, as she was ushered into a little reception room. A few minutes later, Charrington took her to the door of the den, where Knight received her with casual cheerfulness. This is an unexpected pleasure, he said. Don't let us bother with conventionalities, Don, she exclaimed, her emotion showing itself in petulance. I had to come and have an understanding with you. An understanding? Knight was very calm, so calm that she, who knew him in many places, was stung with the conviction that he needed to ask no questions. He was temporizing, and her anger, passionate, unavailing anger, beating itself like waves on the rock of his strong nature, broke out in tears. "'You know what I mean,' she choked on the words. "'You're tired of me. There's nothing more I can do for you, and so, and so, oh, Don, say I'm wrong, say it's a mistake, say it's not you, but she who doesn't want me. She's jealous. Only say that. It's all I want.' just to know it is not you who are so cruel, after the past. Knight remained unmoved. He looked straight at her, frowning. What past? he inquired blankly. You ask me that. You? We have never been anything to one another, Knight said. Not even friends. You know that as well as I do. 
We've been valuable to each other after a fashion, I to you, you to me, and we can be the same in future if you don't choose to play the fool. She was cowed, and hated herself for being cowed, hated Knight, too. What do you call playing the fool? she asked. Behaving as you're behaving now, and as you've been behaving these last few weeks. I'm not blind, you know. You have been trying your power over me. I suppose that's what you'd call the trick. Well, my dear Madalena, it won't work. I hoped you might realize that without making a scene, but you wouldn't. You've brought this on yourself, and there's nothing for it now but a straight talk. My wife is not jealous. It's not in her to be jealous. If she doesn't like you, Madalena, it's instinctive mistrust. I don't think she's even seen the claws sticking out of the velvet. But I have. I've seen exactly what you were up to. You talk about our past. You want to force my hand. You expect me, because I've been a decent pal, and paid what I thought was due, to pay a higher, a fancy price. I won't. My wife had no hand in keeping you out of the Easter house party. It was I who said you weren't to be asked. You had to be taught that you couldn't dictate terms. You wouldn't take no for an answer, so the lesson had to be more severe than I meant. Now we understand each other. I doubt it, cried Madalena. You mean I don't understand you? I think I do, my friend, and I'm not afraid. If I'm not a white angel, certainly you're not. We're tarred with the same brush. Forget this afternoon, if you like, and I'll forget it. We can go back to where we were before, but only on the promise that you'll be sensible. No cat scratchings, no mysteries. It was all that the Countess de Santiago could do to bite back the threat which alone would have given her relief. Yet she did bite it back. Her triumph would be incomplete in ruining the man if he could not know that he owed his punishment to her. But she must be satisfied with the second best thing. She dared not put him on his guard, and she dared not let him guess that she meant to strike. He would wonder, perhaps, when the blow fell, and say to himself, Can Madalena have done this? She must so act that his answer would be, No, it's an accident of fate. Knight was not the sort of man who, for a mere wandering suspicion, without an atom of proof, would pull a woman down. And there would be no proof. "'You are not kind,' was the only response she ventured. "'And you are not just. I did not want to scratch. I would not injure you for the world, even if I could. Yet it does hurt to think our friendship in the past has meant nothing to you, when it has meant so much to me. It hurts. But I must bear it. I shall not trouble you about my feelings again.' If she had hoped that her meekness might make him relent, she was disappointed. He merely said, "'Very good. We'll go back to where we were.' That same evening Madalena wrote to Ruthven Smith. She took pains to disguise her handwriting, and, not satisfied with that precaution, went out in a taxi and posted the letter in Hampstead. It was a short letter, and it had no signature, but it made an impression on Ruthven Smith. End of chapter 15